You might have noticed that today is Innovation Day at Cadence, by the, judging by the big sign uh, over the front door. That's when they honor their patent awardees over the past year. I'd like to welcome our speakers. We have with us Rich Brenner, CEO of the Brenner Group, Rajiv Batra, partner at the Mayfield Fund, who is kind enough to stand in for Naveen Chadha, who is ill, Rich Garnick, CEO of the Conjoin Group, and Rich Lawson, managing partner of Huntsman Gay Global Capital. Finally, of course, our moderator, Steve Bankston, director of Emerging Company Services, PwC. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Quickly, a few Churchill Club announcements. This week, on Thursday, November 5th, we present a breakfast program called State of the Startup, the New Entrepreneurial Order, led by Guy Kawasaki with a panel of founders of five startups from five different areas of the industry, Delight, Liaise, Objective Marketer, Vitamin D, and Unity Technologies. So it's not too often that we have two great breakfasts within the space of one week, and so we've decided to offer the people in this room something special. Uh, if you pay to get here today, you can register for Thursday's breakfast for free. So if you're interested, simply check in at the registration desk on your way out. Hope you can join us for that. Next, on November 10, the widely respected Jim Goodnight, founder, chairman, and CEO of SAS, is going to speak to you, our audience. SAS is the largest privately held uh, software company in the world, and uh, Dr. Goodnight is number 33 on the list of wealthiest Americans, according to Forbes this year. And I know that um, he is also a personal hero to many, and it's a very special opportunity to hear Dr. Goodnight speak. So please plan to come. And finally, it's our seventh annual version of the Gadgets program, featuring Walt Mossberg of the Wall Street Journal, Kara Swisher, his co-producer of All Things D, Gadget Geek Extraordinaire Greg Harper, and their celebrity guest geek of the year is Facebook's COO Sheryl Sandberg. And that's December 3rd in the evening in Palo Alto. If you are not a member, we do encourage you to consider joining us. You can take advantage of either our corporate or our individual membership packages and um, be proud of your support of this organization and get yourself connected. Details on upcoming programs and membership are, of course, available on our website at churchillclub.org. Um, I would like to acknowledge and thank our two sponsors for this morning's program. They are the Conjoin Group and Guten Gutenberg Communications, with a special thanks to Hugh Burnham, who is here in the audience. It's been a great experience to work with these two firms, and I encourage you to get to know them. Uh, our moderator, Steve Bankston, heads the Emerging Company Services Group at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Prior to his considerable impact at PwC, Steve was involved with four different startups, including as CEO of Why Not, um, an internet service company that I personally used and loved. He also ran sales and marketing for the group that founded, uh, that co-founded Travelocity in the early days of the internet. Steve shares something in common with Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, in that he is an avid bridge player. Um, he may have some other things in common with them as well, but I'll um, let you ask him about that yourself. Steve, we're honored to have you lead our panel this morning. Please welcome Steve Bankston. Thanks, Karen. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, venture capital and the private equity outlook, talk about what's new, what's different, what's coming. And we have our esteemed panelists of a uh, bunch of rich guys and Rajiv. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the past year, uh, we've seen unprecedented change and uncertainty in both the venture capital and private equity world. And today we're going to uh, address all those issues, uh, solve all the problems, and answer your questions uh, concisely. At least that's our stretch goal. Um, the uh, format for today uh, is uh, we're going to have each of the panelists uh, talk a little bit about their uh, background and their firms, uh, as well as any topics uh, that they think are particularly pertinent to this uh, area. And then I'm going to start firing away questions till I see <coughs> questions from the audience. So if you have a question, raise your hands early and often, and we'll try to get them all addressed today. And uh, with that, uh, we'll just go down the panel and start with the rich number one, uh, Rich Lawson from uh, Huntsman Gay Global Capital. Rich, uh, you've got the floor. 
maybe just a, a quick second on, on who we are. Uh, we are very much an old economy firm, uh, but a brand new first time debut private equity fund in this environment. We raised and closed uh, a little over 1.1 billion about three months ago, uh, which was for us quite an accomplishment, pretty excited about that. Um, we count among our investors some of the largest uh, uh, domestic and international uh, pension funds in CalPERS and CalSTRS here in, in California, as well as Alp Invest in, in Europe, uh, GM Pension and Government of Singapore and others. Um, we have grown very quickly. We're pretty excited. Most folks know us more here in the Bay Area because my other partner is Steve Young, the former Hall of Famers uh, 49ers quarterback. Uh, and we recently uh, had the former uh, CFO of Citigroup, uh, Gary Crittenden, join us as well. Uh, but very much an old economy firm. We've already closed on three deals uh, with traditional financing, third-party financing in this environment in the last three months. So uh, I hope to bring a very interesting perspective that there is a lot of opportunity out there for venture capital and private equity. Thanks, Rich. And next up is Rajiv Batra uh, from Mayfield, one of the uh, oldest and most celebrated uh, venture firms in the Valley. So um, Mayfield's been around for about 40 years. We actually celebrated our 40th anniversary this year. Uh, we are a, a U.S.-focused uh, venture capital firm that also operates uh, with uh, funds on the ground in India and China. Uh, we raised our uh, 13th U.S. fund last fall, uh, which is about $400 million. That's <coughs> the, the size of the funds that we raise every, you know, call it three to four years. We started investing that uh, earlier this year. And we closed our first India fund, which is uh, about $100 million, uh, focused on lower middle market uh, private equity uh, investments in India, uh, primarily non-tech, although some of our investments there are tech-related. And then we closed our third uh, China affiliate uh, earlier this year, which is also about $400 million. Uh, in the US, uh, we are primarily focused on early stage investment opportunities although about a quarter to a third of our investments go in sort of later stage special situation uh, sort of venture slash private equity style uh, investments. Thanks, Rajiv. And uh, next up uh, is uh, Rich Garnick with the Conjoin Group. Well, thank you, Steve. And uh, unlike uh, the storied uh, organizations that you both are with and all three of you are with, uh, our organization's new, but I'm old. Um, <laughs> I've been in the uh, the uh, business of uh, technology and uh, global businesses for 30 years. I founded the Conjoin Group about 18 months ago. It's a different model. It's the convergence of capital, high-end strategy, global services to basically focus on partnering and transforming troubled business assets. We've already made one investment where we transformed an existing portfolio company of a private equity firm, took an underperforming business, and, um, and in essence turned it around financially and we're looking and seeking to invest in the mid-market companies uh, that are existing uh, in private equity and venture uh, capital firms, portfolios, uh, new or existing. Thanks. And uh, last but not least, at least according to him, is uh, Rich Brenner from the Brenner Group. <laughs> Good morning, Steve. And uh, speaking for the other riches on the panel, our father, my father always told me that he named me Richard so with a nickname of Rich so that I could never be poor. And, uh, and here we are today talking about private equity. Uh, our firm, uh, the Brenner Group, is uh, 20 plus years old. And uh, we have uh, basically two distinct business groups. One <coughs> provides interim executive management to emerging growth technology and life science companies. And the other provides uh, uh, private company valuation services and financial advisory services. And in both fields, we're either the largest or one of the largest in the United States for the service that we provide. But the reason I'm sitting up here today is that I have been an active angel investor since before the term angel investing really started. Um, and that's over 20 something years ago when early stage companies were primarily found, uh, funded by venture capitalists. And uh, in the early 1990s, uh, uh, my partners and I saw a need to come in under the radar screen of deals that might otherwise get funded, provide them with a little bit of capital to see if we could get them started. And and wasn't in the classic venture model, it was really just a group of guys providing some money. And uh, today the angel community has gotten very organized. And uh, you, you, you don't see as many individual angels 
as you saw 20 years ago, what you see now are groups banding together to help each other in due diligence and management and in sharing expertise. And so that's sort of one of my reasons for being here. And um, uh, two claims to fame that I want to throw out at the table on the, on the group this morning. One is uh, there's a small company. How many of you are carrying a Visa card in your wallet right now? Okay. Uh, I was the seventh employee of what is now Visa back in 1972 when it was National Bank of America card. And the idea of being able to have a card that was used worldwide was not very uh, acceptable. And we had to put systems in place to try and help that. And, and the, the other claim to fame is uh, I, I am uh, on the board and one of the founders of probably the fastest growing bank in the, in the country, which is Bridge Bank, located here in San Jose. And that was one of my angel investments that I did a few years ago that has turned out pretty well. So not only technology, but also financial <coughs> services. Thanks, Rich. Just to get a uh, feel for the audience, how many of you work in private companies? Most. How many are in public companies? How many are actively now or will soon be trying to raise money for your organization? How many aren't working? <laughs> okay, that gives you a feel for the audience. Um, the first, first question, um, you know, all of you work in or around either private equity or venture capital. Could you just chat about what's different in your world from a couple years ago? Uh, and what do you think will be different in a couple years from now? Anyone? All right, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, first of all, as an angel investor a number of years ago, um, what we were looking for, you know, was... Uh, um, when you buy real estate, there are three things you look for, and it was managed, uh, uh, relocation, location, location. When I was an angel investor, the first thing I would always look for is management, 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 hoping that the management could, could find, navigate their way around any potholes in the road and, and develop a good technology. And so we would invest in them knowing, and there's the key word, knowing, that two to four years later, the venture capital community, if we had developed this great team and a good technology, would fund the company to completion. One of the early questions we ask now when we look at a new investment is where is the, how much money will the company need to make it to a, a liquidity event and where is that going to come from? And if we don't have an initial opportunity uh, to talk to a source now uh, and it's a lot of money, we probably will not want to invest in that as an angel deal. So that's one of the changes I think we've seen. The, the early stage companies are being funded by angels, but they are we are looking at where's the next round going to actually come from. And from our perspective, if I may add, um, what we've seen is obviously what many of you have seen is a, in essence a reset economy. And the uh, legacy of private equity backed companies, venture backed companies that where money, capital was easy, have now have a new situation on their hands where they have to extend the runway to achieve that liquidity event because there's no clear path to IPOs. Strategic acquisitions have, uh, you know, you're starting to hear some, obviously just in the news today, Black, uh, uh, Black and Decker and Stanley uh, converged and are large deals that are talked about in the media. But where the big challenges is in the mid-market companies that were funded from 2000 to 2007, when capital was easy, financial leverage was the approach, we believe that you now need to go, need to go back to basics and do, earn your value the old-fashioned way through operational excellence, through uh, streamlining the operation, uh, efficiency and execution, and growing the top line through innovative means. And uh, our business model is focused on converging those aspects together uh, where you still uh, leverage financial, uh, financial engineering, but it's linked tightly with operational execution. Uh, from our standpoint, uh a couple years ago, things have gotten obviously very frothy. We've seen a lot of, uh, you know, Me Too deals, management teams that were, you know, interesting, but they shouldn't really have been doing um, startups or trying to sort of, you know, yet copy another idea. Uh, now we're seeing much higher quality investment opportunities. It is taking longer for people to raise capital. Uh, valuations are, you know, in, in the early stage business, valuations tend not to matter as much just uh, because. If the idea works, it works. Uh, but we're seeing a lot more uh, sort of grounded teams, uh, people who are very brave, not the faint of heart, uh, repeat entrepreneurs who are sort of getting back out there. We're seeing a lot of people come out of large companies because 
you know, it's not that exciting to a large extent to be inside a, uh, maybe a Google or, or a Cisco or a Yahoo or whatever it is. So we're seeing a lot of high quality flow, uh, teams that are much more grounded, more patient, uh, and thinking through what they want to do uh, a lot more before they sort of sit down with us. And we're happy to engage with people when they're sort of, you know, before they're even starting to think about doing something. So that's the phase we're in, and I think we're in the phase where some new uh, great companies are going to get uh, started and created in. So we're pretty excited about what we're seeing out there. I would caveat how we see the world a little bit differently because we're a little bit more later stage. So the, one of the more recent deals that we just closed was the world's largest manufacturer of pillows that you might find at Costco. So a uh, decidedly different type of model. Um, but I think what might be interesting and useful is our, our challenges in trying to raise a first-time fund in this environment well in excess of a billion dollars. And I think the, the things that really uh, many sophisticated institutional LPs were looking for uh, was one, a significant commitment by the GP. Uh, so we committed as a small group of partners uh, a little over $100 million of our own money, cash, not fee waiver, uh, to have real skin in the game. And I think that's fundamentally uh, much how the VC and private equity model is changing as you think about folks fundraising. I think the other um, fact is, is, as we saw and we talked a little bit about the frothy <coughs> market that occurred prior, um, you really need to be able to step up with a, a very significant track record. We were able to bring a track record of well over 200 deals with top quartile returns. Um, so so I, I think as we look at the landscape, it's fundamentally shifted. So many uh, folks are out there now trying to raise uh, follow-on funds or debut funds and, and are having significant trouble. Um, those were two areas that we felt um, we were able to distinguish and differentiate ourselves. I think the third one was our pure focus on the middle market. So rather than early stage or mega buyout, late stage, larger type deals, we were firmly focused on medium-sized businesses, uh, predominantly in the U.S., where we could effectively bring global relationships, hence the name global in our name. Um, but, but by really focusing on businesses that had 25 to $50 million in EBITDA or cash flow, whether they be emerging growth uh, technology businesses here in the Valley, where we're in a number of dialogues, uh, or, or other more traditional industries. But, but that paradigm has shifted. So having those three areas that we focused on really allowed us to raise a billion dollar fund in 13 months. Now for many people, uh, debt has become a four letter word again. And that really caused a, uh, a lot of the problems in the private equity world, which uh, used uh, leverage uh, magically, let's say over the past uh, number of years. Um, you know, that market is still really in chaos. Um, uh, it affects the private equity world much more than the venture world, although there has been a lot of venture debt uh, in the venture world, more so in the past five years than probably ever before. Um, but particularly for uh, Rich Garnick and Rich Lawson, who, who probably, you know, look at the debt markets more, uh, use debt more in your deals. Uh, how has the debt market changed? What is the current state? Can you get any debt? If so, what can you get? And do you, do you see that slowly improving, quickly improving, not, not changing at all? How would you characterize the debt markets these days and your, your vision of what's going to happen? Well, if I yeah, maybe just start on uh, what we're seeing in the mid-market is that a, still a very tight credit crunch uh, still exists in the mid-market. If you're not performing and driving cash flow, the, uh, the banks and the lenders are really, really uh, challenging uh, many companies. We're also seeing a lot where we're, we're seeing deal flow is where a lot of companies are missing covenants. And that's where it starts exposing opportunities where people are willing to acknowledge that they have challenges with their portfolio companies. Uh, up until then, many, it's amazing to me how both the managers of some of these companies the operating people and the owners of these companies tend to actually um, go and delude themselves for a long period of time that there's not an issue. They don't want to face the brutal reality or the facts in a way that you know, they need to. And it's only when they start breaking covenants that they have to acknowledge what's going on. So they need that outside influence to acknowledge where they're at with their, with their situations. Um, and that's where we come in. Uh, w one of the things we're working on is building a shared service finance team that is absolutely world class at helping not only with the operating finance aspects, but also restructuring the debt that has been layered on these businesses because it has been applied under such frothy conditions. The famous uh, phrase of two years ago uh, was covenant light uh, deals. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, those covenant light deals are, have all blown up. Last year alone, in 2008, there was 120 major companies that went bankrupt in North America. 
75 of which were private equity backed. That says that the financial engineering alone has some fundamental flaws. And it's where you use great financial engineering, and it's an important aspect, but linked with operational excellence, that you could actually create shareholder value is what we're driving for. It's not rocket science. It's motherhood and apple pie. It's the basics. And uh, the basics are you know, what you need to win in many games. You got Steve Young you know, on your team. You know, it's, you know, Lombardi said, you know, it's not that you have fancy plays. It's student body right. And when they went, it was a matter of execution. It didn't matter what the playbook said. Now, he ran the West Coast offense, I know. And, you know, he wouldn't uh, have one or two plays. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. And, and I think, as Steve will always say, I mean, p part of our model is every deal we do, we employ traditional third-party financing. And we've been able to do that three times, three distinct times in, in literally three months. Um, I think for us, perhaps we're a victim or a, 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 a somewhat of a byproduct of the environment. By having no portfolio, we're not engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with our banks and our, port our prior portfolio on facility extensions or covenant forbearance agreements. So for us, we've had a, a more traditional uh, and, and very successful um, relationship with these third-party banks. And, and I would tell you, as we sort of think about what we do, spanning the globe from uh, a pillow manufacturer in Boca Raton or world field maintenance business in, in uh, Texas or, uh, or a uh, uh, specialty transport business that erects windmills, uh, in Louisiana. In all these cases, we were able to actually get traditional, middle market, senior lending, uh, plus mezzanine financing in, in every one of those deals. And, and I guess, uh, you know, quickly, in terms of what we're seeing, probably two and a half times senior, a turn, turn and a half of, of mez. So anywhere from three and a half to four times, and that's very different from a market two years ago where yeah. people were relying on four, five, six times leverage. Uh, we just don't do that in the middle market in more medium sized businesses. Let me, let me just comment from an availability standpoint. To the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, uh, debt is available. That's, that's, you know, the banking industry is alive and well. The banks are trying to find good companies to loan money to. I mean, we're, we're the long, long gone are the days of, you know, well, if, if you got a loan from a venture, if you got an investment from VC to match it with debt. But the banks are, are actively looking to loan money and the, the venture lenders, the, the long-standing groups, are back in business. They have raised new funds, and they're there to find a way to help you extend your runway. So, you know, the woe is me uh, that we heard about the debt crisis earlier in 2009 is, is the clouds are lifting, um, and there was probably a little bit of an overreaction. Uh, interestingly enough, the tech sector, uh, the lenders in the tech sector, have not had as bad a time as other parts in the United States. And so, this you know the the the, the black cloud over the valley uh, is not in the debt sector as bad as it is in the rest of the country. It is available. The, the only comment I would make on on sort of uh, raising debt uh, by venture backed startups and, and early stage companies is that. Uh, Venture lenders should look at the company and the teams that they're backing Absolutely. because you know there was this model of reliance on, hey, you know the venture investors will ultimately underwrite uh, the the debt investments that debt investors would make, and that that's just the that that model's not necessarily going to play out, and so you have to look at the quality of the syndicates, um, and when we reserve for our investments and our companies, we are sort of thinking about the syndicates we're in. And if we think that there is any weakness in the syndicate, uh, we have to sort of think about uh, you know, the reserves very carefully. And so this notion that you know, the venture investors will you know, sort of carry the, the, the bag for the, the debt investors is, is a flawed view. So as entrepreneurs, you should be mindful of that. Uh, and, and I agree that you know, debt's available, but it is expensive, so one has to sort of figure out. And in the right situation, it makes a lot of sense. And so we, you know, in the right situations, we do encourage our companies to think about, uh, you know, sort of extending their runway and thinking about capital structure in a more effective manner. The, the one thing I'd add to that, though, is, you know, the, the warrant-backed lenders, uh, many of them have realized that cash today is more important than warrants because the opportunity uh, for home runs on warrants uh, that they used to take in every deal they did has diminished, you know, dramatically. We're going to talk hopefully this morning, Steve, about the IPO market and the exit market, uh, but the values have gone down. And so the value of the warrants has diminished. Therefore, 
the yield to the lenders is probably higher now on a cash on cash basis than it was three years ago or two years ago. And make no mistake as well, overall pricing, while there is financing out there, it's very different from five years ago. So LIBOR plus 325 uh, five years ago is now LIBOR plus 700. So I think to the point of, of really understanding businesses and not relying on financial arbitrage, you really need to have uh, an operational hat to understand where these businesses are going. Zero growth LBOs, zero growth type deals, uh, relying on arbitrage on the back end is, is not going to be something that can be successful in the long term in this environment. Okay, let's talk about the, the, the world. All of you play on a global stage. Um, it's kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy now. The, uh, in the PwC Money Tree, just, just released Q3 this year, Silicon Valley had a record high market share for the U.S. 46% of the dollars invested in the U.S. were in Silicon Valley, which is why we're probably having this meeting right here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, even though, think of all the cities in the world that are trying to be the silicon fill in the X, yet Silicon Valley's market share is, is literally higher than it was uh, 13 years ago when we started the survey. But every day we read about India and China and a whole host of other countries also trying to be the silicon fill in the blank. Uh, all of you play globally. Uh, let's talk about what's going on in China, India, and other markets that you're excited about and, you know, how. You know, what kind of threat do they pose to Silicon Valley and the U.S. more broadly, uh, short term and longer term? Well, um, you know, I, I, my greatest focus is uh, where we have operations in India, uh, but we've been in China and uh, other parts of the world. In, in India, I think you're seeing uh, overall economic growth has come back faster. Uh, but I think the issue of where people are putting money into ventures, it's still a... Um, an emerging market for uh, new deal initiatives. I think they're, they're looking for uh, the mega opportunities are in infrastructure within the domestic Indian marketplace. It's in, uh, you know, India still has a 30 to 50 year runway of rebuilding the country, uh, which I think has a, a lot of latitude to, uh, and head, headroom to grow, uh, whether it be water, power, and infrastructure. Uh, in China, I think their, their focus is obviously manufacturing and export. So, um, you know, you're seeing opportunities, but um, you know, you know, the concentration of, of deals being done right here in the uh, this bay. I'm actually a resident of the other bay in Boston, um, on the east side. We call it East Bay. East Bay, that's right. Where the Red Sox play. They're yeah. very east. <laughs> um, we have a good baseball team, hopefully. Uh, but uh, you have a, you have all the investment. But I think it's you know, you got a tremendous. Uh, dynamism here in the Bay Area uh, around technology and innovation that's really powerful and it's around creative destruction and rebuilding enterprises on, on a perpetual basis and that is what we have to stimulate and I'm worried a little bit about you know the overreach of, um, of government getting involved with uh, business activity and and will stymie the innovation that will come out of this sector and uh, for all of you entrepreneurs in this marketplace you know, each time we go into a recession, um, you know, people pull back. I, I launched the business at the time of the recession primarily because that's when great businesses get founded. And we wanted to get out there and we saw opportunity in, within those dark clouds. And we're, we're, those opportunities are plentiful. You just have to have intestinal fortitude because it is not easy. And you have to have a clear vision and be grounded at a management level. One of the things we chose to do is our management team happen to be all many people that have worked with and around our organization in the past. So there's a deep understanding and heritage of working together so that when you go through good times, everybody, you know, it's real easy. When you're going through challenges, you have to be able to work as a team to be effective through those challenges. So these are some of the things you gotta be thinking about. But from a market standpoint, I see India and China as being dynamic challenges, but opportunity for us if we embrace it. We shouldn't look at it like it's a threat. We should see it as an opportunity. And how do we take advantage of that as business people and entrepreneurs uh, in this marketplace? Our, our view has been, you know, when we invest in India and China, so we have funds that are uh, focused on those geographies, so we don't invest out of our U.S. fund into, into those geographies. Uh, and we have local teams that are on the ground. <laughs> and we have sort of matched the, the uh, investment philosophy and strategy with what we see as the opportunity. So, for example, in India, uh, I agree with Rich to my right, uh, is, is much more about sort of basic infrastructure, basic services, uh, 
and it's a, it's a big macro play. Um, India is largely sort of like the U.S. was maybe in the 50s or 60s. And, uh, you know, we typically invest in companies where we get in, uh, you know, there's, there's still sort of subscale, maybe 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 million in revenues, uh, growing 100% year over year, where we're buying in at two, three, four times, five times EBITDA at the most. Um, and so you're really looking, you know, you're playing into the growth trend. Um, and, uh, you know, leverage is not, it, it, it's not available. The, the debt markets are not like the markets are here. Um, and in China, uh, it's, it's a similar sort of approach, but it's more focused on the internet and, and mobile space. Uh, but the two recurring themes in both those areas are we're focused on domestic market opportunities as opposed to companies that are going to rely on global markets. Although if, if the companies have an opportunity for global markets, that's, that's nice and interesting. We think in order for venture capital and private equity to thrive in a, in a meaningful way, you have to be able to serve sort of domestic markets and build uh, the, the, the business from a long-term standpoint on the, on the local economy. Um, to your point, Steve, uh, you know, this, this whole question of why 46% here in Silicon Valley, you know, I, I moved to the, to the Valley in about seven years ago, but I have been coming here for the you know, last 15 years, and I never understood this whole sort of craziness about Silicon Valley. You know, it's like one idea after another, the, 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 the next idea crazier than the one prior to that, and, and uh, it's only after being here for a few years you get it. Uh, people in the Silicon Valley are purveyors of dreams, and uh, and that's what uh, I think allows people to sort of uh, you know think you know the impossible, fall down, get back up again, as if nothing had happened, and start all over again. And it, it is it is a very very unique characteristic uh, that is very very special to this place. And even outside of the valley in the U.S., it, that that way of thinking does not uh, sort of prevail. Um, so people here are purveyors of dreams. That's what they keep, you know, doing over and over, and, and sort of marshalling their their agenda. And uh, and I think that's what uh, you know makes this place attract the, the capital that it attracts. So. Yeah, I, I'm on a, I'm almost a contrarian a little bit to to the idea of of, of a threat from India and China. Um, if you study history, uh, if anybody's history buff, in every industrialized society, as any industry matures lower cost markets are found to continue the development of that technology or that industry. Whether it was the printing presses from the 1800s or the television market or the automobile market, and now we're in the PC markets, it always goes to a low cost market. And right now, you know, we, we had a big fear of outsourcing everything to India back in the late 90s. And then it was China was going, about, well, in the, in the, and in the 80s it was Japan. And then, and then you had India. And now people are, you know, China. Well, China and the U.S., by the way, have this symbiotic relationship. We depend on each other. If China ever decided to stop exporting and stop buying our debt, our economy would see an incredible inflation rate. But so I, I think China's uh, economic balance with the U.S. has to stay intact. But I think there are other markets where we're going to see, uh, if you look at India today versus 10 years ago, as an example, wage rates have come up and have, have rise dramatically. And so the cost savings that companies saw a number of years ago in India are not there. Eastern Europe is developing, I think, as another potential um, um, brain trust, if you will. There's low-cost labor. There's very intelligent engineers. And, and you're, I think we're going to see a movement of a lot of venture money into Eastern Europe. Um, but, and, and to your point, Reggie, it, it was very interesting. I, I did some work in, the, in Europe a couple of years ago, and I've done this in Asia. And when you see the, the reason they can't replicate Silicon Valley, there, I think there's two factors. One is failure is a stigma. It stays with you for life. And in, in around here, if you get some skid marks on your back from a failure, that's a badge of honor as long as you learn from your mistake. The other issue is how high the tree grows. When you see a business plan for an entrepreneur in a different market other than Silicon Valley, and they see a success of a business at $5 million, five years, seven years out. They don't, they're not able to see how to grow a business to be a Cadence or a Cisco or an Intel. They just don't have that, the, the, 
the mentality of the international community doesn't have that, uh, that same entrepreneurial spirit. So I think that we will continue to see outsourcing. We will continue to see a globalized market, shrinking world. But I think that we're going to go from you know, Japan to India to China. And I'm looking now at Eastern Europe as an opportunity. On that point, though, if I could just touch on, I agree with a lot of what you said, except the last piece where you talked about the fact that um, you know, people seeing the success and, and scaling. In fact, in India, you know, companies like Wipro, Emphasis, TCS have grown from nothing in 2000, very small companies, to multi-billion dollar corporations, and they have hundreds of thousands of employees in each of those. And many of the employees have dreams now that say, not only do they have an in innovative idea, but they want to build global enterprises with scale of that nature. So I think it's a generational shift. I think that's an opportunity. That's a challenge. Calling I, old, you're calling no, me no, old. No, I no, got no. it. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we're both in the same year. So, um, you know, at Wipro, for example, we had 70,000 employees when I was there, and the average age of the population was 26. That's the average. Uh, I was the old man in the organization, and uh, you know, you have all these. Uh, and in fact, India will have 45 percent, I believe it is, the demographics of the world population under 15. And uh, so, therefore, you know, we got some demographic shifts going on. That I think we got to be cognizant of, but uh, I think Silicon Valley is unique, and and I'm not saying there's uh, there's challenges, but those are with those challenges, recognize them, and you can turn them into opportunities. Okay, um, so speaking of which, just a random fact: uh, roughly 2020, India will have more people than China, so uh, that'll kind of change the uh, tenor of the conversation. But our our panel today was billed as venture capital and private equity outlook, implying you know what is the outlook for later this year, and more importantly, 2010 and 11. So in your worlds, uh, what do you think will be different, if anything? Is 2010 going to look a lot like 2009, uh, et cetera? Or uh, is it going to be better, worse? And specifically, what's going to be better or worse? Uh, Rich Lawson. I think the dislocation between uh, seller's expectations and buyer's ability to finance is certainly beginning to moderate. Um, so we're seeing quite a bit more activity uh, I think that in conjunction with the fact that folks are looking at and very concerned about tax treatment in this country uh, related to cap gains and ordinary income is also driving some activity that we've begun to see. Um, so, so I think generally there's more optimism. There's obviously the, the, the credit markets are, are coming back uh, at, at a level that could support some transactions, whether here or abroad. Uh, you know, Skype is a, a great example with Silver Lake and others is a larger deal uh, that, that actually re relied on third-party financing, uh, traditional financing. So, so I do think that uh, there, there is a sense of optimism. Again, my, my view will be very interesting to see because many others believe that uh, the future of private equity in particular uh, is very challenged. And, and I think you need to really segment out uh, what and how you define private equity. And I think today uh, there is an opportunity for a number of new emerging, uh, not to be talking about our opportunity, but uh, first-time funds to come out with no portfolios and, and create new platforms because many of the current uh, funds that are out there have experienced great difficulty in having large portfolios that were over leveraged that will require an enormous amount of work in the coming years. So, so I think while there is a sense of optimism, I think there will be great challenges for uh, quite a few people in the private equity community to continue to, to deliver decent returns in the next five to ten years. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the venture industry uh, needs to be a healthy industry. Uh, means it needs to generate you know, good returns for its limited partners. Uh, and, and so the, the pace of investment activity feels like the, the pace at which we are at right now, plus or minus, sh is, is the right pace to actually generate the returns that the asset class has uh, you know, traditionally generated and, and investors have looked to. Uh, the pace of investing that you saw sort of in, in sort of the 07, 08 time frame, which was sort of clipping at about six to eight million, billion dollars a uh, a quarter is, is it was not healthy. It, it's just not going to generate the type of returns. Um, so, Rajiv, you'd, you'd, you'd predict we'd be in the four to five billion a quarter range next year. That feels more like equilibrium. I, I think four to five is probably, un, unless you sort of have a you know a, a whole new sort of sector, whether it's energy tech or clean tech or whatever, start to emerge. Uh, if you're sort of in, uh, investing in more traditional enterprise IT, consumer, internet type of sectors. I think even four to five billion dollars is probably too much uh, because the industry as a whole has been sending back uh, 
call it about $10 billion of returns uh, annually. And, you know, if you're investing 4 to $5 billion, you're sort of outpacing the, uh, the capital that you're even sending back. So, so that would imply a slight decrease next year because we're at 4 to $5 billion now. I mean, Q1 is the only quarter in the last not, 10 years below that. Yeah, I'm not saying that we'll, we'll go down. You asked the question, what's healthy? Um, you know, I think healthier is probably a little bit lower, but I, I think, you know, we're all optimistic, so we'll, we'll probably be around where we are. Uh, but I think one, one, one area that we will see pullbacks are, have to do with what Richard to my left has said is that people will be uh, running out of capital and uh, there will be a, lot, a bunch of funds that just won't be able to raise follow-on capital or new funds. And so you'll, you'll probably see some of that, some of that uh, retracting and uh, there will be some consolidation in the industry and uh, you probably will not see a, you know, as much uh, money going into sort of pure venture as it may in sort of growth capital or some other areas that uh, a lot of venture firms are are uh, extending their footprints into. To expand on that you know, just for a second, I guess, our view is the outlook, uh, it's a function of where the funds are in their life cycle. The legacy funds that have been invested since 01 through 06, 07, we see opportunity for our business model. Uh, because they will be challenged for exits and for dealing with uh, what do they do to extend the runway either uh, or get follow-on funds or whatever they deal with their existing portfolio. And uh, for new funds like yourself, it, operally the landscape's wide open because you don't have that legacy. You have a really a great buying opportunity and that's where we're at too because we think the, you know, valuations were really frothy two years ago uh, and the opportunities just weren't as rich as we think they are today. Because you know, you always—it's pretty simple. You want to buy low and sell and uh, sell high. It's not rocket science. The trick is executing between those uh, trials and peaks. So we're we're focused on that. Well, I'm I'm going to look from 2010 and beyond, not just for 2010. I think 2010 is going to be equal to uh, uh, approximately the four billion dollars a quarter range. I agree that, that that's a comfortable level that the community can handle. I also agree with Rich number three that uh, you know we we are uh, you know we, we got to be careful to not outpace the amount of money that's available. The traditional venture model that we have seen ha is changing, and there's it, where we used to have uh, you know as, as recently as ten years ago we had a bifurcation between uh, venture the, the venture capitalists took the early stage to middle market companies and then it went to private equity as a mez round and then you have a liquidity event. I think the what you have now is that the I'll call them the organized angel community is picking up at the very bottom of that which will feed into a venture community which will feed to, to private equity because the exits come later and, and, and it takes more time and more capital. Um, I believe that 2010 will start seeing a fallout in the venture community um, the numbers of funds are going to drop dramatically as people have invested their capital uh, and can't uh, raise another fund. What's, dr I, what's dramatic? You think half the funds will go away? I don't know, 40, 50 percent, Steve. I mean, it's in that magnitude. And by the end of 2011, I think we'll see most of that played out. Uh, 2011, economically, is, is, is predicted to be uh, not a below, uh, is going to be worse than 2010. Uh, but not recessionary, and 2012 is when we, the economists predict that this thing starts really coming out. So uh, look for a reasonably good 10, flat to down in 11, and then coming out in 2012. Okay, on that up note, we're going to go to questions from the audience. Uh, no, come on, Steve. You, were, you know I used to be a lot more negative than that. Come on, Dr. Dez, calm down. <laughs> what, 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 question in the audience over here. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you guys could comment a little bit about uh, maybe some specific industries that you might be interested in or that has some potential for growth in the next year or so. Okay. Industries. Some quick, quick firing answers. We're, uh, we're focused on business services, technology-enabled business services in healthcare, financial services, and telecommunications primarily, uh, where we could affect the business with our model. Medical device, life science, clean tech. Uh, next generation enterprise uh, data centers, uh, software as a service, cloud computing, I think are 
big long-term macro trends as uh, enterprises retool themselves, and these technologies finally enable uh, sort of what we call the the uh, uh, you know the true democratization of IT and proliferation of IT into the true middle market, lower ends of the market, and global markets. Uh, we do believe that energy tech is a very interesting opportunity, and that's distinct and different from you know what a lot of people in the valley call clean tech. It's not just enough to be clean. You actually have to have an economic basis for investing in energy-related uh, technologies. And we think that the third area that, that, that's on the periphery uh, and is also going to be pretty exciting is uh, education, uh, delivering education through sort of innovative means, using the Internet and other things, and uh, healthcare uh, uh, technology and IT. We're really focused on industrial services right now, anything that touches the, the industrial world from a services standpoint. Business services is also an interesting dialogue. I will tell you that opportunistically, many things have come to us as a result of this larger impact that we've been talking about in terms of venture capital and private equity, whereas two, three, five years ago, um, you wouldn't think that uh, in a million years a venture firm, uh, whether it be early or mid-stage, would approach a, a later stage middle market private equity firm, but you can't have uh, the, always the number one cloud computing deal or, or network storage deal. So over the past five to seven years, there is a portfolio, a uh, massive portfolio of uh, number two, number three, number four players, where we're now having dialogues opportunistically that we didn't even search out proactively in a variety of sectors and technology, specifically with venture capital firms as opposed to uh, third parties. Here you go. Second question uh, right, right here. So um, my question is, um, I guess I see private equity and venture capital as distinct venture, as distinct asset classes. So my question is directed to Ravi and to Rich. Rich just made the prediction that there'd be a... Rich, yeah, Ravi and Rich doesn't really narrow Sorry, it Rich, down. Rich Benner <laughs> just made the prediction that there'd be a substantial consolidation in the space in the area of venture funds. And I do remember, Steve, maybe six or seven years ago, you also stood up and made a similar prediction. That's why I have Rich say it now. Right. <laughs> so... But in fact, what happened back during that time period is that as the industry consolidated, it also fragmented. And what happened is that there was a lot of, a lot of money that poured into some of these boutique uh, venture firms that sprung up across the landscape. So I guess my question to Ravi and to Rich Brenner is, why is this period different than it was back in 2001, 2002, 2003? The, uh, I think the first thing is to look at the, the return on investment that the limited partners have seen in the last nine years. That back in 2001 through 2003, the, the limiteds were still riding on the return on investments from the 90s. And they were the venture, and as a sector, venture community was returning 20 plus percent at that time. Today, if you look at a 20 year average, they're down to, what is it, 14, 15% now, Steve? Yep. But if you look at a 10 year average, it's negative. And so that's why you're going to see the shakeout, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, capital always chases returns. And so, you know, uh, so I, and, you know there, there are no returns, so capital may retreat. Uh, but I think it's also fundamental liquidity, right? It's driven by liquidity. You know, you see Stanford and Harvard selling off their alternative investment portfolios. I mean, when, when blue chip limited partners are sort of retreating from the asset class, um, you know what does that what does that mean overall? Uh, so I think it's a combination of factors, and you know maybe it's a perfect storm sort of ensuing at this point, where you know a lot of these firms are end of life, their funds they haven't been able to raise more capital. It's you know the 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 asset class isn't generating the returns. It's retreat of LPs. It's it's a it's a variety of different I think factors. So we'll see how it plays out. But you know one thing to keep in mind from as a perspective is. You know, the venture industry raising, whether it's 10, 15, 20 billion dollars annually, is a drop in the bucket when it comes to the overall private equity uh, investment landscape. So, you know, from a, from a real macro standpoint, it's really noise. Um, but, you know, we will have, I think, a bit of a shakeout. Yeah, okay, we've got time for one last question. Better make it good. 
Not that long ago. Uh, we alluded to exits. Um, IPOs uh, have uh, been up a little bit this year, but still terrible by historic standards. Uh, there's been a lot of M&A deals, but the average, the median M&A exit is something like 25 million with something like 16 in, so you don't make it up in volume. Uh, so exits have been terrible. I mean, that is why the returns of the venture industry have been terrible for a long time. Uh, the iBankers are just start talking about oh, all the meetings that they're having uh, to uh, file S1s and uh, talk about the S1 filings in September and they're holding all kinds of meetings, uh, endless enthusiasm um, from that sector. What do you guys see? Do you think 2010 will actually be better than 09 in IPOs or M&A or are we looking at the same you know, pretty weak year? Marginal. Marginal. I think the, uh, the open table IPO which was going to lead the, fro the, the, the charge again on IPOs. From, uh, from offering to now, it's up, but only up 15, 20 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, there are about six IPOs uh, that were filed for registration last week. Now, whether they all go out this year is still uh, up in the air. But there is a lot of pent-up demand if the market is going to re be receiving it. You know, we, had, we lost a lot of gain ground on the, on the Dow last week, uh, the investors going back into their hibernation mode, it's unclear. So I, I, I don't know. I, I think that there is a pent-up demand, Steve, whether it's sometime in 2010 or, or beyond. I can't predict when it's going to break. So you'd say 10 looks a lot like 9. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Investors hate uncertainty, and we have both economic uncertainty and we got fiscal uncertainty with tax regulation and tax law you know, thrown wide open and what's going to happen to the investment class. Uh, if uh, long-term capital gains goes, uh, some of the other policies, I don't want to get into a policy uh, viewpoint here, but uh, it's creating uncertainty that is delaying investment and creating uh, opportunity uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, people are going to have to extend their runway because they won't have exit opportunities as frothy as they have in the past. So, so far we've got two votes for 10, looks a lot like nine. Does anyone have a different perspective? Steve, I think I'll answer the question slightly differently. I mean, I think the question is one of exits and sort of a vibrant exit environment and, and sort of how do, how do people achieve liquidity. I think uh, people have to sort of think about IPOs uh, in, a, in a different way. Uh, you know, most tech companies that go out are sort of, you know, they're not, they don't move the needle for institutional investors. If somebody gets a five, six, seven million dollar allocation, these institutional investors are large guys. It just doesn't move the needle uh, like it did maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, and so, so you know, the, the way the industry has to think about exit and liquidity is to think about broader set of options. Yes, you need a vibrant, healthy public market in order to encourage uh, or to, to sort of make sure that the companies have good currency, you know, larger companies have good currency, uh, and the threat of IPO is a viable one for M&A to step up which is what we've been seeing. There's a lot of cash-rich tech companies that have to, in order to grow, uh, you know, acquire, and that model is now an absolutely proven model. It's not about competing with Microsoft or Cisco or Oracle. It's really figuring out where the gaps are and filling those for tech companies. Um, and I think beyond that, we have to be more creative about you know, secondary markets, secondary funds, private equity uh, companies, buying uh, portfolio companies of venture-backed companies. So I think you have to think about, and also going public on, on international markets and things like that. So you have to really think about liquidity and exits in a, in a much more broader sense because I, I don't think you have an IPO market that's going to look like 96, 97, 98, 99. Mm -hmm. And truly, the, the companies that truly deserve to be public, there's not many of them, you know, the ones that can just sort of continue to be independent, strong companies long term. It's interesting for us, it's somewhat counterintuitive, but for, to I think the point we've discussed on the panel, the, the period of somewhat negative returns in the venture industry in many ways has driven the kind of increased dialogue we've been having because as you think about going out to raise another fund, if you will uh, go out and do that successfully, you need successful realizations. And there is a new paradigm, at least for us, that we're seeing as a fund that is now crossing over into private equity and venture capital. As venture uh, companies have become more traditional middle market businesses. Uh, the opportunity exists for many of these companies in the portfolio of some of the larger, more established VCs out there to take some chips off the table. So I can, uh, I'll tell you, we're in six or seven dialogues today uh, where there's an opportunity to come in uh, and allow that VC to, in the absence of a, a frothy IPO 
uh, and new issues marketplace take some significant chips off the table, perhaps uh, continue to roll over and, and own 20, 30, 40 percent of the business, but be able to mark to market what the value of that, fund, uh, what the value of that investment was. And, and I think that, so for us, as we see where the IPO market is, it's probably challenged, uh, but it creates even more activity on the M&A side, at least it has been for us. And I think that will continue over the next two to three years. I, I absolutely agree with that, and I think that, you know, we started this dialogue this morning, rich number two here, talked about getting back to the motherhood and apple pie. You, if you're building a business, build a business which can sustain itself at some level. And maybe doesn't, the tree doesn't grow to the sky, but it becomes a nice elm tree. So grow a business that can sustain itself, be cash flow positive, and then if the opportunity arises for, for attracting capital for growth without turning you into a cash pit, a cash drain, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, I want to bring up uh, Karen Tucker, CEO of the Churchill Club, for some final comments. Thank you. So, Rich, Rich, Rajiv, and Steve, thanks very much for sharing your insights and opinions with us this morning. As a very small token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you with a limited edition, much sought after Churchill Club t shirt. <laughs> Thanks again to our Thank sponsors, you. Gutenberg Communications and the Conjoin Group, to Cadence for hosting us, and to all of you for coming. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Yeah, when you're out in the area, we need to meet you.